you you guys didn't pay any royalties to to the military no we but we used their materials okay and they there was no material that was exclusive to them at the time we did it uh generally the government particularly if you're talking about the military wants right. to work open source they want to work with a couple of suppliers for something in which case you usually don't have a a, a restriction problem yeah i mean and i guess that's a good idea also for you guys because um the r d was already done by them so it's way cheaper and the r d and and the volume production if you try to produce a a woven fabric you have to produce tens of thousands of yards to be able to get to any reasonable economic price and and if you're a startup company making apparel i mean even in today's world you don't use ten thousand yards and Welcome to YFamily.com, the podcast, a place where young entrepreneurs get inspired by people like you who don't just talk about their dreams and aspirations, but actually do and take action. To today, we have Hub Club here. He's joining us from the Bay Area, and he's the founder of the North Face. Um, you know, you probably don't need much introduction, um, but I'll let you introduce yourself a little bit. You know, um, tell us a bit about uh, your background and your, your career. Well, thank you, Roger. Good to be with you. Uh, yes, I did found the North Face. I'm probably best known for that. I got an MBA and a, an undergraduate degree from Stanford. And then after that, I started the company uh, right away and, and built it. I, I ran it for 20 years. I've now sold that. And I'm involved in a number of activities. I do some teaching at universities like Holt and uh, University of California, uh, Stanford, and those classes. I also write a couple of books. One is behind me called The Conquering of North Face. It, another one is called Almost. One is about success. The other is about failure. And uh, then in addition to that, I have a consulting company, HK Consulting, that uh, works with a number of companies around the globe. And that has me serving on, on a couple of boards. Uh, I'm particularly interested in disruption. And uh, ESG, as they talk about it right now, is where I'm focused because I think that's the future of consumer goods and certainly will be in both apparel and the outdoor business. So uh, I'm working with one company that out of Chile that is making a substitute for leather. Uh, it's made out mm -hmm. of mycelium, which is what mushrooms are, mm -hmm. and it's environmentally very friendly. Also, on a preemptive healthcare company out of uh, Dubai uh, that works on IV drip therapy and DNA analysis to help oh. people forecast what they should eat, what pharma they should have, so they can go forward. So, where disruption is involved, where it has to do with with apparel or it has to do with the outdoors, I'm particularly interested. Yeah, <laughs> I, I see. I see. And for example, like, yeah, just let me ask you this uh, before we start, though. Um, that company from Chile is like the the continuation of the North Face for you, uh, so, is it? Oh, it is. It is one. It's within the sport and apparel business, and two, uh, it's based on a, a concept of replacing existing materials with something that is uh, technically much better, environmentally much better, right? And so it's a replication of that same thing. They're looking at being an ingredient brand, whereas North Face was actually an end brand, direct to consumer brand. Um, the ingredient brand would be sold to other companies that actually would be developing that. Wow. The... Yeah, sounds amazing, though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I definitely want to want to see how that goes. Um, yeah, so... Um, you started the North Face, but you bought two, two stores, right, that already existed. Um, why did you decide to to buy those stores and not start from scratch? Um, you know, like, you know better than me, but um, I would think that starting from scratch is easier because you get a lot more freedom. Um, yeah. What was your, why was your decision like that? observation i mean the first thing to recognize is there wasn't much in the way of restrictions there was a great name they had the name the north face and there was only about three hundred thousand dollars in sales however what i knew from the outset was in terms of adoption of a new product which i had dreamed about in my mind which was much more expensive than existed on the in the marketplace i knew the product adoption for that was going to take a while it was going to be uncertain mm -hmm. and what wanted 
was two things. One was we wanted some positive cash flow while we waited for people to find us. And by having your own store and selling products, not only our own, but products from other people, we had what we called Safeway money. We had enough money coming in, we could pay for the growth. The second thing that I wanted, and, and it was disruptive at that time, it was sort of an omni-channel approach, wanted to be in touch with the consumer. Uh, it's now called design thinking when you talk about deep customer empathy. But the idea of having your own stores, your own, and we had a catalog then that we developed, and being in touch with actual customers who are telling us what they want, we thought would be the best way to refine the product that we were making and, and make it correct. And, and so taking stores that existed had some cash flow already. They already had some customers coming in. And as I said, they had a great name, the North Face. Hmm. Got it. Um, yeah, I mean, you had the MVP already working um, and, you know, functioning. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, makes sense, makes sense. And and so that's something investors like as well, you know, something that works already. Was it bootstrapped or you you got funding from investors? It was bootstrapped initially. I put some in, some of my own yeah. money in, okay. the bank money. But then I would say about a year out, once we had things set up, I went to his, uh, his friends and family uh, to be able to bring in the next round. Mm. And... And then later on, we brought in some outside investors. Okay. Um, is it possible to know how much uh, you, how much funding you got in the outside investors? Or, well, you know, it, it varied over time. I'm mean, okay. initially with about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Okay. And and after a while, we probably we didn't get up the big numbers you normally talk about, but we we got up to about ten million in terms of equity oh. that we. Oh. That that's cool. That's cool. And well, you know, shifting a little bit away from the North Face, um, do you think it's a good way for all startups that can scale, you know, to you know become a unicorn to seek funding, or they could do like you did, you know, start bootstrapping it? Um, well, yeah, that's an answer that can't possibly uh, be answered because it depends on the business you're in. Yeah. It depends on investment you have to take in on the front end if it's a lot of investment required before you can ever get your your product to market then you're probably unless you're elon musk or somebody you probably don't have the capital to do it on your own i prefer to develop it initially yourself before you go to other people why uh, well generally what you find is a business plan that's developed is not the plan that rolls out almost every company has to pivot from their original plan. If you're bringing in outside investors, you spend a lot of time convincing them that your plan is great. Mm. Then it becomes much harder to pivot once you've seen what the real reaction in the market is that you need to pivot to. Now you've got to convince them. Whereas if it's you alone or if it's family, it sort of believes in you when you say, well, we thought we were going to do this, but the market's telling us to do a little something else. It's much easier to do that way. But right. as I said, only really works if what you're doing doesn't require a huge amount of capital on the front end. Uh, if it requires a huge amount of capital, then you may just have to change your pitch and go outside. But I will tell you that fundraising from sophisticated professional investors is very, very difficult if you don't have a track record, which you can show them, if you don't have a uh, something that is sort of not a proof of concept, they like that, but also proof of your ability and your team's ability to execute. Much easier to convince uh, angel investors uh, that uh, look at things which are not fully developed. Right. Well, I also, yeah, I also think that it also depends on if there's a lot of competition there, right? Because then if there's a lot of competition, you need to move faster and then you probably need a lot more capital to start. Um, yeah. For sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, going back to the North Face. So was it your goal um, to start a, you know, apparel company like that, you know, that, you know, a multinational one like it was, like it is today? Um, or was it like an accidental business in a way? Um, yeah. 
Good question. Again, the I mean, the first thing is, is I had two passions uh, when I started the company. One was a passion for the outdoors, and two was a passion to change the world. And I thought that we could change the world uh, by using a business. I'd read Throw a long time ago, and he said something that really resonated with me. He said that in wilderness is the preservation of the earth. And I knew that from my own experience going out there, I believed and we believed as a company that if we took people deep into the wilderness, uh, that they would come back, they would be better stewards of the earth, they would uh, recognize the benefits of being an environmentalist and whatever. And so we wanted to do that. Now, you know, initially, I did believe we needed to be a multinational company. Uh, the, the reason I believe that, though, was uh, practical. And that was, we were selling a niche product. We were not just an apparel company at the outset. We were an outdoor company. We sold sleeping bags and tents and packs for people that were doing really aggressive uh, movement into the wilderness. That's a fairly small market. If you're only selling people in a small geographical region, you may not have a large enough company to survive. I knew that there were a lot of people that embraced that, wanted to pursue uh, deep into the wilderness, but I had to amass them from around the globe rather than uh, locally. Now, you, you may laugh at that now because the company has morphed. It, it is uh, more apparel than mm. it is outdoors run by VF Corporation, which is a fantastic parent company now, but VF uh, VF specializes in, in apparel and yeah. they've, they've built that apparel. But initially it was more of an outdoor company hmm. that had that niche that we were uh, pursuing. Wow. And, and what was the first country you expanded to? Um, and were there any any you know issues like when you go when you go abroad uh you may you you have to adapt to different cultures and different different markets right um was it hard in that way or you know uh you you, you spoke the same language you know well it was difficult uh what we did was sell uh in europe in particular through initially a catalog we didn't have e-commerce at that time mm. and our catalog out there the first real physical move that we made to establish something happened to be in Japan, which might not be the first market that anybody else would choose uh, because you have a language difficulty there. You certainly have a cultural uh, difference from the U.S., hmm. but they appreciate very good product there. And we were making the best product in the world. And so they were really drawn to us. And so we went over there and talked with them and ended up getting a distributor as a partner. Uh, so they set up the infrastructure. They knew the various differences in the way the things were marketed. There were a lot more layers of distribution that you set up and we we're able to do that. So when we knew we wanted to go out there, we didn't take the risk of putting our own capital in to do that. Hmm. Then later we moved to Europe and we actually uh, set up a factory. We acquired an existing apparel factory, uh, Blacks of Greenock. And hmm. so they had all the machinery and they had all the seamstresses and everybody there and mm. we did that inside the eu okay and set, set up our team to do that and we did it out of england actually it was out of scotland mm. uh but it was one it was a uh, lower cost to get into the eu from there the second mm. thing is that was just what was spoken there so we could easily interact with many of the people that work there although right. if you and sometimes you may wonder if it's English, but uh, but it is, and uh, they and we we developed that way, and 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 there were there were issues, but probably less cultural issues than you would find in many other countries. Okay, um, and how did you? What was the process of um, scaling this? You know, gigantic business it is today. Um, I guess you started with the small team. Um, when you bought the company, well, when you bought those two stores, um, there was a team already there. But I guess you had to build a stronger team to like go and build this. This, yeah, yeah. We ultimately anybody that was there uh, because they didn't didn't really fit in. And I had a mm. concept 
developing our own product line. They made none of their own product. Uh, they were bas basically retailers uh, that had good stores. They sold some other product. Uh, my feeling was we could insinuate ours as we went in, but that meant we had to get somebody who could sell wholesale, uh, who was good at, at accomplishing that. It meant we had to bring in some people that knew something about manufacturing, uh, which was entirely different. Uh, so, uh, so I had to hire a bunch of people. I didn't hire anybody with business background. I hired people mm. with, uh, first of all, a passion for the outdoors. Mm. Or, and the second thing was a passion for changing the world, which I said, that's what we were trying to do. I figured with my background, uh, my MBA, and I'd run a family company, I'd be able to teach them about business. And so we were looking for people and we got a lot of really bright people uh, who, who would have been successful on their own. But 11 of those people that were with us early on went on to run other companies. Hmm. So I, I learned how to, how to run a business coupled with their native intelligence. But one of them founded uh, Mountain Hardware. Another one ran Birkenstock. Another one ended up uh, starting a company called Title IX, women's performance out where another one ran uh, the international and in, in japan for uh patagonia uh mm -hmm. somebody ran a company called Thule, which is a a rack company for automobiles and whatever and so uh the idea initially and uh, was that we bring in people we'd educate them about how on business uh i would bring in people every year uh, to educate them we'd have long range planning meetings i'd bring in professors from business schools uh people who'd run other companies and we did the education that way so right. the scaling all about setting up the team as you said but setting up a team that was divided focused on we had a manufacturing side and and wholesale side we had retail side that we had to do we had a catalog in there we set up omni-channel, which nobody did at that time. Uh, they said you couldn't do it, but we believed in disruption and we believed getting close to the customer would help us develop our wholesale. So we, we did that. So we set it up sort of divisionally, brought right. in somebody to finance, which was really accounting at the outset. And then accounting became finance later on. Yeah. You mentioned yet yeah, like this, this dream, uh, this, uh, you know, this goal of, you know, disruption and all that. Um, you, you had that from the beginning or you built on it. Um, right. Yeah. Well, I had it from the beginning. I, I really, okay. I really knew where we're going to go. I didn't know all the specifics, but I, I knew that because I was close enough to the field, I knew that there was a need for a change. Generally, we were at the outset trying to convert the camping industry into something where people would go deep into the wilderness, later became known as backpacking. Mm -hmm. But what we did was take materials from the Vietnam War that were very lightweight. We took aircraft aluminum and made tent poles and pack frames. We took parachute cloth and made sleeping bags tents and, and some funky clothing it lightened the load that people carried so they went deep into the wilderness so they would actually experience what throw was talking about and we we're able to accomplish that now over time uh, what we did was pivot uh, to more to the apparel but at the outset and you'll find this somewhat humorous we found apparel as an addition to our existing business hmm. we made sleep and tents and packs and they all sold in the summer and we said well how do we get a year-round business we said well if we add in some apparel and the apparel we had was outer door outdoor not outerwear uh we you know we can balance the seasonality out hmm. well now the seasonality is entirely tipped you know as said i would guess that 85 percent of the sales are in apparel now with 15 percent being in what we called hard goods but wow. uh, but we, we had this idea that we were going to uh, disrupt existing business because it was a time for disruption. We were going to do it in terms of business model. As I said, we're omni-channel at the outset. In terms of our business practices, we, we had an ESOP program where employees all own some part of the company. And we yeah. always did terms of product development. So we did it with the Vietnam materials and then we're one of the first uh, to incorporate Gore-Tex and then uh, to improve our, our tent sales 
I collaborated with Buckminster Fuller, who was this philosopher genius who had discovered geodesic concepts, and he mentored a team of our people and were able to revolutionize the tent market. Okay. Um, going back to what you just mentioned of the the military the military um materials how is that process you so you bought a company you partner up with the military uh you bought th those patents how that how did that work is like i don't i don't think that's um the first thing it comes to someone's mind you know i don't see it happening too often uh, We didn't get patents from them because I, I would totally agree with what you're saying. What we found is they had a problem and we helped them with their problem. That's usually the easiest way to work with anybody mm -hmm. and working with them that way. What happened was there'd been a lot of tooling up for the Vietnam War to produce parachute cloth and, and aircraft and whatever. And, and then as that effort wound down, they found they were sitting with a lot of excess material and they're trying to find markets for the excess materials. So going into these people and saying, we can help you out. And n none of the materials that were being used at that time cost as much as the ones we bought, but they would have been infinitely larger if they'd only been developed for our industry because they were developed for this large governmental industry. Then, uh, then they were acceptable in price. Now, that being said, I do advise and, and, and observe on a board of a company, a company called Oros, O-R-O-S, which is an apparel and technology development company that did get their patents from the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. And the, what, they went to NASA and they took the patents for insulation from NASA. And then it was two people at the University of Miami who were uh, engineers. And what they did was develop that material which was used only in insulation of, of uh, spacecraft. And they developed a variation of that material so you could incorporate it into clothing. And then they pay a royalty to NASA, but they work in conjunction with NASA. And, and they were able to do that as two students at school. Now, what they did was talk to them about making a variation of their existing patent. As I said, the patent itself, the material was a great insulator, but the insulation would not work in apparel uh, because I won't get into the details of it, mm. but it would be the right uh, form factor to be able to go into apparel. They said, we will develop while we're in school an adjustment to your patent and we're able to do it. So, uh, so don't shy away from it. And you don't need to shy away from some of the other people that provide technology. There's a lot of universities that have technology transfer departments that basically the professors say, I don't want to sell my, my things. I just want to develop or invent. Mm -hmm. And so the university goes out and signs licensing agreements with various companies to develop that technology. And so it's sitting there. And if you have an idea you want to develop, or if you just want to go in and see what they're doing and see how you can build on that, that will happen. Mm -hmm. But for example, you guys, you you guys didn't pay any royalties to to the military, no. We, but we used their materials. Okay. And they, there was no material that was exclusive to them at the time we did it. Uh, generally, the government, particularly if you're talking about the military, wants right. to work open source. They want to work with a couple of suppliers for something. In which case, you usually don't have a a, a restriction problem. Yeah, I mean, and I guess that's a good idea also for you guys because um, the R and D was already done by them, so it's way cheaper. And the R and D and and the volume production. If you try to produce a a woven fabric, you have to produce tens of thousands of yards to be able to get to any reasonable economic price. And and if you're a startup company making apparel, I mean, even in today's world, you don't use ten thousand yards at the outset. You develop usually a proof of concept, a development line, a capsule collection. They test a little of it. If it happens, then maybe next year you buy more. And then if you really worked it out correctly, then about the third year you're buying a lot but mm. but if if you had to take the cost of just producing let's say 500 yards or a thousand yards of something nobody could afford it i mean the, even in the most luxurious lines people couldn't afford that type of, of production right right if you were to start the the north face today again um 
would you be able to do it the, the way you did or times have changed um and you know you need to do like other things differently right well some things we would do the same some things we would do differently one is it was based on building a brand and i would argue you could do that and you should do that all the time because brand is an annuity for the future. A brand is shorthand. And in today's world where people don't have much time that they give to thinking about any product or company, having a brand is a good way to do that. What is different or what I believe would be different is the speed of growth of our company. As I told you earlier, you know, I, I didn't hire anybody for their business skills at the outset, I hired them for their passion and whatever. And we had time to develop and educate those people. And so while we were growing and we thought it was really scalable and we doubled year over year over year, uh, which grows pretty rapidly, but it's not like what you see today. Today, one, you, uh, you're multinational from the day you're born. Uh, because mm -hmm. if you go online, all of your competition sees you, all the customers see you, you have to be world-class at the outset. We could develop something first in the Western region of the US and expand it from the Western region to all of the US. And then we could selectively go after one country and another country. You can't do that now. Today, you have to set up your company as if you're gonna be global. You're going to have to count on more rapid scaling. And when you have more rapid scaling, you're probably gonna to have to bring in people with more proven talent. So they're ready day one to contribute more than what we have. Right. And would you still start it in the Bay Area or would you go somewhere else? Well, I would start in the Bay Area, but that's my choice. I mean, the energy and the views that you have in Silicon Valley are second to none. Uh, you have, first of all, you have an environment where nobody is afraid of failing. And when you're not afraid of failing, you can, because there's no penalty here. If you mm. fail, you still get funding, you can still get support. But uh, when you have that attitude, then you can set outside goals that are really huge that you can try to do. If, if you're in an environment and you start in, in countries where failure is a big problem, or in regions where people doubt you, you're going to set up very nominal growth goals, and you're going to grow at a very slow rate. So I think that that's one reason. I think a second reason, uh, we got a lot of our employees uh, at the higher levels of our company from the universities that exist here. And there's a lot of major universities, Stanford, where I came from, University of California, uh, there, there are some at uh, Carnegie Mellon, then you've got you've got 2 million students that are coming out of school in the Bay area. Mm -hmm. And that's a fertile ground to bring in people with great ideas and whatever. In addition to all of the things technically that existed at the time we set it up, uh, the Bay area was really a hotbed of political activity. And it brought a lot of people in. It was the center of the free speech movement. It was a, a place where people really thought they were going to change the world as they developed. And and that was part of the mentality we were trying to incorporate. It still is that way, although I think you see other, other geographies embracing it. But I don't think you yet see that sort of incubation mentality, that scaling mentality, that, yeah. that lack of fear of growing something that is totally disruptive and going to change the rest of the world. And you have right. great here in Silicon Valley, design thinking, lean startup management, agile mm -hmm. software development, all of those things are about speed to market and improving your approach. And those keep being developed here. So just being in the center of that, you can quickly tap into those ideas. Now, yeah. Oh. Although that is really expensive. And right. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. Well, sometimes you're just going to have to locate elsewhere because you can't afford to be here. Mm. But you know, I mean, it just—it's that. It's what you said. Um, when you, I mean, when you surround yourself with people who have the same dreams, who want to change the world, that also motivates you. So you know, that also helps you get there uh, faster. For sure. Yeah, for sure. And and you know, the, I never believe that people follow people in, in terms of leadership. I think they follow ideas. And what you do is spend a lot of time 
developing, communicating your ideas, and then selecting people who embrace those ideas. Because ultimately, particularly as you get larger and larger, no one person is going to drive the company. Uh, it's going to be the team that drives the company. And so that you have to have a consistent view because a brand is built over time consistently and persistently. A brand is like coral. You know, it, it, if it follows certain rules, it just mm. develops. Nobody sees it changing. But at a certain point, certain inflection point, it is so beautiful and it is absolutely so unique, there's nothing like it. Mm. And in business, that's what you want to be, totally differentiated from everybody else. And all you need to do is three things to accomplish it. The first one is make sure that everybody follows the same rules or, or guidelines. The second thing is consistently put that forward so it's seen again and again. And then third thing is don't shift from that. The North Face logo, we put in uh, the probably the second week that I, after I'd started the company, got it from a graphic person. He gave me 10 mm -hmm. ideas. One of them, I said, yeah, maybe that'll work. We got to put something on it. We chose that logo and the logo lasts until this day. There's only been yeah. one change that was done. And that was in some applications, there's a rectangle in red put around the logo. That's because in, in things like on the front of a store or whatever, the logo alone would be a little awkward to mm -hmm. do. But that basic logo remains the same. So the idea is you build that brand over and over, and everything you do is consistent with that, and you make decisions uh, to not do things if it's inconsistent. Right. Well, we're almost done, but let me ask you something. Um, so... You know, that was your baby. That was something you built from scratch. When the time of selling the company came, um, what did it feel like? Well, it, frankly, it felt okay. It felt like something, uh, it was time for me to leave. Yeah. I mean, the reality was that the company had evolved. We were growing so rapidly that I was doing outside uh, investment banking uh, it takes about six months to do a a fundraise, and we were doing fundraising at, at least every two years and maybe every year. So six months a year, I was being a, an investment banker, and that wasn't what I liked. This isn't what I was trying to do when I built the business. I had no no concept of doing that. Had I had that concept, I would have gone into investment banking, but that wasn't what I was doing. The second part about that was we were bringing in so many people from the outside. I was constantly battling with people to try and explain what our brand was about, why we held to what we were doing. And so I was spending time fighting with people that I brought in that I needed financially to grow the company. Mm -hmm. And so I would finally went through another one of those rounds of fundraising. I'd raised 10 million that we were we needed to come in. But one of my board members who who had been very supportive of me for a long time, uh, he came to me and said, Hap, you said that, you know, when it wasn't fun anymore, uh, you, you weren't going to be around. And it looks like it's not fun anymore. You're, you're doing less of what you want. You're fighting uh, more people, spending way much time managing your investors and, you know, First of all, at that point, my ego was saying, no, 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 I really want to continue this on. But then having listened to him and what he was saying and looking at at the landscape that was out there, I said, you know, you're right. Hmm. You know, it is time for, for me to sell and somebody else to right. come in. Wow. <laughs> Why not go public, though? Uh, well, there's a couple of things. One is I wouldn't have been a good person to run a public company. Hmm. Uh, you know, I, I had a lot of idiosyncratic ideas that nobody agreed with at that time. More people are agreeing about it now. I wanted to make a product that lasted forever. I thought it was the most environmental product that ever existed. So we had a lifetime warranty. Hmm. A lot of people argued about that. I believed in triple bottom line, which is paying women the same as men, hiring people, whether they were from any part of the world, whether they were uh, gay, transgender. We, we hired everybody because we just wanted the best people. Right. All of those concepts were ones that people disagreed with, were argumentative and whatever. And I was constantly pushing those as part of the, the profile of the company. Take that to the public market and you probably are not particularly at that time, would not have been embraced. It would have right. been probably rejected. So that was one aspect. The second thing was in doing that, you know, I was already having uh, problems managing a limited number of investors I was bringing in. 
this would give me a whole bunch of additional investors and I'd be spending more of my time on that management. And I didn't see that as very attractive. And, right. and probably the, the third reason was at the time I did it, the market wasn't, uh, when I sold the company, the market wasn't really robust. It, the, the market for IPOs is cyclical. You know, sometimes it's really good and other times it drops off. Uh, you can see this in the last year or so. Uh, mm -hmm. Last year is really a great time really to sell your company. This year it's <laughs> a little, a little uh, dicey out there. A little Not question. so good. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, I mean, it, it was it was it was amazing uh, having you here. Um, I don't know if you have anything else to add, um, but I had uh, had a great time, and yeah, it was great. There's there's a quote I might leave you with that uh, that I hang on to, but it's what I tell all entrepreneurs, and it's a quote from Goethe, who is a German philosopher. He said, "Whatever you can do, or believe you can." begin it because boldness has genius and power and magic in it mm -hmm. it's really true and what i would encourage any entrepreneur is just start something don't try to plan the perfect thing because it you aren't going to have the perfect thing anyway you're going to have to pivot but what really gets action is creating a a, a prototype it is creating mm -hmm. an idea it's throwing something out there once you yeah. do that you get reaction to it. Now you're off and running, but you can sit around and talk forever right? and never start your business. Right. That's, I think that's something that happens uh, a lot, right? Uh, people talk a lot, but then don't do. Um, that's actually one of the purposes of this podcast. Um, I bring people that have done stuff, you know, to show people that um, it's possible. And thanks, Hub. Thanks for coming. Um, sure. Great to see you, and, and yeah. I hope this is helpful. Mm -hmm.